بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin with the grace and blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal in today's class studying the chapter that deals with الصوم that deals with fasting and as we know that fasting is one of the pillars of Islam and the definition of fasting linguistically is to refrain linguistically you could fast from talking as mentioned in the Quran inni nadartu lirrahmani sawman falan ukallima alyawma in siya I have pledged today that I fast from speaking so I would not talk to any human being but we know that the linguistic definition is not what counts but rather what counts is the Islamic definition or what we call the technical definition and fasting is defined by to refrain from things that nullifies your fasting from the break of dawn till sunset with the intention of worshiping Allah. And this is very important that you have this last phrase, with the intention of worshiping Allah. Because I could fast, and a lot of the non-Muslims fast from things that nullify their fasting, but the intention is not for the sake of Allah. The intention is for dieting, the intention is for losing weight, the intention is because the doctor told them not to eat or drink. So is this considered to be fasting? No. The proper fasting is to refrain with the intention of worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. And Ramadan is known as the month of patience because fasting is an excellent display of patience and the pillar that is fasting it only fasting of Ramadan so it is not fasting of Ashura or Arafah or the white days or the Mondays or Thursdays it is only fasting the month of Ramadan this is what's a pillar upon every Muslim and Muslimah so it is the month of patience and scholars divide patience into three types and they say that all of these three types are found in fasting the month of Ramadan. So when they say patience, they say that you have to be patient in not doing the sins and you have to be patient in doing the mandatory things and you have to be patient when the calamities of Allah befall upon you. These are the three types of patience. And whoever attains these three types, he is considered to be the patient one. In fasting Ramadan, you have all these three displayed. So you fast from haram. You fast from things that are sinful. The Prophet tells us والسلام, that he who refrains from eating and drinking but does not refrain from false testimony and saying false things, Allah does not need him to stop eating and drinking. Meaning his fasting is not accepted. If you continue to do bad things and sins, especially testifying falsely or saying false things, this means that your eating and drinking did not change anything. Also in fasting Ramadan, we have patience on doing what Allah instructed you to do. And by stopping eating and drinking is an excellent display of obedience to Allah and of your patience on doing things that Allah commanded you. And of course, the greatest type of patience would be to be patient when the calamities of Allah befall upon you and hunger and thirst is a calamity not being able to do halal things 
such as having intimacy with your wife is a calamity, but your patience is highly rewarded by Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is a training session. Ramadan is a training session because anything that is considered to be addictive, Islam tells you not to be addicted to it. Islam only wants you to be addicted to worshiping Allah and remembering Him and striving in reaching Allah's pleasure. For example, your addiction to food and drink, which is halal, Allah tells you, you have to take a break so that you would not be enslaved to halal things such as intimacy with your spouse, such as eating and drinking. Be free because when you are able to control yourself over halal things, it goes without saying that your control over haram things would be even stronger. If a person does not drink water because Allah tells him not to drink water, do you think that he will be able to drink alcohol? He would have a stronger will than any other person. And that is why Islam forbids you from being addicted to things, especially haram things. So those who are addicted to smoking in Ramadan, they display their obedience to Allah by quitting for 16 hours, which means that if they have full confidence in Allah and trust, they will be able to stop the full 24 hours. All what you need is to believe. Once you believe, Allah Azza wa Jal will support you and Allah the Almighty would guide you. And who is it that fasting is mandatory upon? It is mandatory upon every Muslim who is sane, who is or has reached the age of puberty and who does not have any restrictions from fasting. And what do we mean by restrictions of fasting? For example, a woman in her menses or a woman in her post-delivery bleeding, is she obliged to fast? Is she permitted to fast? No, she's not. So this is something that restricts her from fasting. A traveler, and this depends on the traveling, but it's a permission from Allah that a traveler may skip fasting and to make it up when he is capable. A sick person, likewise, and so on. So these are the types of people that have to fast. And we know that we have to fast the month of Ramadan, but we have to also go through the process of identifying that Ramadan is due or not. And this is done by observing and citing the birth of the new moon. So we will come inshallah to the hadiths that explain some of the previously mentioned topics. Hadith number 177. Yes, the brother there. It is related from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, none of you should fast a day or two before Ramadan except a man who customarily fast. He should fast that day. In this hadith, the Prophet والسلام, is forbidding us from fasting a day or two before Ramadan. Why is that? Scholars say that there is something that is known as the day of doubt. And the day of doubt usually is the 30th of Sha'ban. And why do we call it doubt? Because if today is the 29th, after sunset, what will we be doing? We'll be observing and trying to sight for the new moon. And that is the crescent. If we sight it, this means that tomorrow is the first of Ramadan. If we don't sight it for a reason or the other, if we don't sight it because it's not born yet, or if we fail to sight it because there are clouds or a lot of wind and dust, what should we do? The Prophet told us والسلام, to assume that tomorrow is the 30th of Sha'ban and not fast. 
So there would be people who would come and say, well, it's an issue of doubt. Is tomorrow 30th or the first of Ramadan? Just for the sake of argument, I will fast tomorrow. Just to be on the safe side. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, this is not permissible. Do not precede Ramadan by fasting a day or two. Why? Because then you would allow shaitan to come into your thoughts and to your life and start to always tell you to be on the safe side. You perform wudu. I washed my limbs three times just to be on the safe side. Wash it once again. You prayed Isha with the congregation just to be on the safe side. Maybe I did not have full khushu or maybe I did something wrong in the salah. I'll pray another Isha. By this, you will destroy your life. You will allow shaitan to play with you like children play with football. Such thoughts and whispers of shaitan destroy your life. So you should not allow this. However, the Prophet ﷺ made an exception. And this exception was for those who regularly fast a particular day, such as Mondays, and Thursdays. So if it happens that today, the 29th of Sha'ban is a Wednesday, and tomorrow the 30th of Sha'ban is a Thursday, and I have the habit of every Monday and Thursday I fast, what should I do? Tomorrow I should fast because the Prophet gave me the permission alayhi salatu wasalam. Likewise, those who fast, the fasting of the wood, peace be upon him, which is fast the day, break the next, fast the day and break the next. So if I did not fast today, and tomorrow is the 30th, is it permissible for me to fast? The answer is yes, because by this, you would be complying and following the Prophet's instruction, alayhi salatu wasalam. We have a short break, stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Allah has not asked us to make people Muslim. Invite, offer, share. Allah has asked us to invite people to Islam. Be a part of the special mission for humankind. Dawah is really an art. We need to refocus on the importance of Dawah. And this is about time the Ummah woke up. In this unique workshop with Abdur Rahim Green. We can't force anyone to be Muslim. What if we, as an Ummah, could once again take up the duty and obligation of Dawah. Learn how to aptly deliver Allah's message of Islam to people around the world in Dava tomorrow at 11.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6 a.m. India on Peace TV. Courage it takes to stand up for what you believe in. Courage it takes to be true and righteous. Courage it takes to dare and answer. Your questions, be they social, political, economic, educational, or religious, to get clear and convincing answers. Test your courage and question me in the dwarf. Dare to Ask, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Hadith number 178. This hadith was narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not fast until you see the new moon and do not break the fast until you see it. If it is cloudy, then you must calculate it. The hadith falls in line with what we've mentioned before. Muslims 
know the beginning and the end of the month by observing the new moon. So you do not begin Ramadan until you sight and observe the new moon at the end of Sha'ban. And likewise, you continue to fast until you sight the moon at the end of Ramadan or until you finish Ramadan to be 30 days. And the Prophet gave us alayhi salatu wasalam, an easy solution out. If there is cloud and we're unable to detect the new moon on the 29th of the month, then you have to calculate it in the sense that calculating it would be that tomorrow is the 30th and there is a hadith clearly stating that فَأَتِمُّ الشَّهْرِ complete the month meaning that it would be 30. So you have only two options. After the 29th day of the month, you either sight the moon or you, if you are unable to sight it or you don't see it due to the presence of clouds, you have to complete the month to be 30th. There is no other third alternative. Okay, then what is the ruling on what Muslim countries or some of the Muslim countries do? They depend on astronomers to calculate to them the birth of the new moon. Astronomers say that tomorrow definitely is the beginning of Ramadan. Can we go ahead with what they had said? even if we did not sight the moon? And the answer is no. The Prophet والسلام, he clearly stated that we are a nation, a ummah that we do not calculate. We are an ummah that does not read. And the month is either this or this, meaning it's either 29 or 30 days. You cannot have the month being 28 and you cannot have the month being 31. It has to be either 29 or 30. So how do we know? By observing the moon. If we did not see the moon on the 29th, then definitely tomorrow is the 30th. And that is it. And you find that even if you were wrong, it will be rectified the following month by sighting the moon ahead of time, or it would be 29 or 30 days. And this goes on throughout the whole year. Fast Ramadan. If one of them sighted the moon or not, it's an issue of dispute. What is practiced nowadays clearly states that every country has its own sighting. And this was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In the authentic hadith, when Quraib, and he was one of the companions of Ibn Abbas, came from Syria, where the Khalifa was, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father. He came at the end of Ramadan. So Ibn Abbas asked him, when did you see the crescent? And they said, on Saturday. So Ibn Abbas said, well, we did not see it on Saturday. We saw it on Sunday. So he told him, are you going to do and apply the sighting of Muawiyah? He said, no, we're going to apply our own sighting. And this is the Sunnah which indicates that each region has its own sighting. But scholars differed in regard to what do we call a region. So if I see the crescent in Mumbai, the people of Delhi would fast or they say, no, we depend on our sighting. It's an issue of dispute. Most likely a region is a one that is governed by a ruler. And the ruler is the one who dictates whether to take the sighting of the adjacent region or not. Some scholars say that a region is what is approximately to be in the diameter of 2,000 kilometers. And these approximately 2,000 kilometers would have the same sighting. What is being practiced today that each country, each government has its own sighting. Usually when we sight the moon in Saudi Arabia, we have all the Gulf countries following us. So they believe and they depend and they follow the sighting of the same Arabian Peninsula, which is quite huge. Likewise, other countries, each country has its own ruling. But the $100,000 question, 
or a million dollar question or a little bit less or more. What is the ruling if the country I'm in, the governor or the ruler does not believe in the sighting and he believes only in the calculations of astronomers. So he says that tomorrow, Saturday, is the first day of Ramadan. Whether people sight the moon or not. What is the ruling on that? Scholars say that you have to follow that ruler. If he's a Muslim ruler, you have to follow him because the announcement of the month is only known through him. So if he's following the Sunnah and he cites the moon, Alhamdulillah. If he doesn't, as Muslims, you're obliged to follow what he says and any sin or burden would be on his back. Because the Prophet said, والسلام, fasting is when you all fast. And breaking the fast is when you all break the fast as we will come to study, inshallah. Do we have any questions? Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Salam. My question is regarding last time when we met, we talked about the expiation of maybe on the Hajj, that when we sacrifice. So that can we eat the meat of that sacrifice? The answer is no. Whenever you pay an expiation, you cannot eat from the meat of the slaughtering. But if you are offering aqiqa, for example, you may eat. If you're offering walima, you may eat. But when you are offering hadi, you should eat. When you offer udhiya, you should eat because all of this is part of the sunnah. The expiations and the oath, the nadr. You do not eat from them at all, with the exception of nadr, if you intended it. So for example, if someone makes an oath, and this oath is not recommended, it is makruh. The Prophet told us not to do it. But once you pledge yourself to do it, you must do it. So if someone says, Oh Allah, if my child passes tomorrow's exam, I will slaughter a sheep. He made it general. Now what is your intention? He says, my intention is to give it to Sadaqah. You must not eat anything of it. If I ask him again, what is your intention? He says, my intention is to slaughter it and to call my relatives so that we will eat from it. Then you can eat from it. It depends on your intention. So I hope your question. Any more questions? Yes, brother. Sheikh, supposing if someone makes an oath to Allah that he wouldn't do this and he breaks the oath, you feed 10 people. Then does he have to continue with that oath or that means that oath is finished? And now if it is continuous, he has to fulfill his pledge. The Prophet said, Man nadara Allah, Whoever pledges that he should obey Allah in doing something that is form of worship, he must fulfill that. So if someone says, if this thing happens, I will fast every Monday. He must fast every Monday. And if he misses one Monday intentionally, he's lazy, he should continue. This does not affect the coming Mondays. So if this is your question, then I hope this answers it. Though we know that it is not recommended to have such a pledge. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam. Question is regarding last topic when we met last time. What is the ruling about zakah on the money people have in their accounts of government provident funds or private provident funds? Can you explain? Government provident fund. If uh, someone is an employer somewhere in a uh, government uh, service, government deducts some money and keep it for provident fund and once he for retires... Re retirement? Yes. Okay, I will answer this question, inshallah. The money that the government deducts from your salary, this is not something that you can use or utilize. You cannot go to the government and tell them, give me my money. They will not give it to you. It is the scheme that after you complete 25 years, they will give you this retirement money on installments once every month. And in this case, it is completely different than your own savings. So this money is not your saving. Likewise, the end of service indemnity. If you finish 10 years or 20 years, if you resign, usually they calculate something and give you the money. 
And this money is also not zakatable unless one year passes because during your service, you were unable to cash this money. It was not in your possession. You're not the lawful owner of it. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fiyamanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.